hey man, are you ticked off at someone right now and it goes below the surface and you're struggling with bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment? Do you have a church that's really hurt you? Today, we're gonna have our guest, Wendell Morton, on the show, and he's gonna help us walk through the process of restoration and forgiveness. Some very practical tips I think will help you a lot. Stay tuned. Today, I want to bring on my new friend, Wendell Morton. Wendell lives in Littleton, Colorado. Wendell Morton is currently the executive director of Men's Ministry Catalyst, which focuses on equipping churches with biblically-based resources, counsel, and services to help them build an engaging ministry to men. God has uniquely positioned Wendell to touch lives so they can move forward in relationships with others and grow spiritually, repair broken relationships, and expand professionally. Hey, Wendell, it's great yeah, to have I, you on the show today, man. How are you doing? Man, I'm doing so good. It's great to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. I'm humbled to be here. I love what you're doing uh, with your with your podcast, reaching the men you're reaching, and touching people that probably nobody else is really getting a hold of. So thank you for what you do as well. Oh, I appreciate that, man. Well, you know, uh, before we jump in, I've read your bio, but why don't you tell the guys listening a little bit about yourself, your context, and uh, what you're doing right now? So um, I grew up in the church, uh, felt called to ministry at age 12, uh, went to prepare for ministry at 19, um, and went through the whole journey of, of Bible college, liberal arts, seminary, got into a church full time, and um, had some challenges in my marriage right away. So clearly, um, you know, I, I was not being the man of God that he called me to be, even though I was in ministry. It happens, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we figured out how to get back together. We got back together. I got in staff a large church in Portland, close to McMinnville, your wonderful home. Oh, yeah. And uh, spent uh, five years there. Great time. Uh, the lead pastor, the founder was moving on. And so uh, I felt that was probably a good time for me to leave. And I, I came on board with Promise Keepers. So I moved to Colorado, spent the next four years in Colorado with Promise Keepers, went through some amazing things to see God move in the hearts of men in ways that nobody could have predicted and nobody had any responsibility for. We were just riding the wave of God at that particular time. So I uh, came to the end of that. Uh, Coach Mack changed the model, and it became a free event, and um, uh, our revenue dropped substantially. I laid off 250 people out in the field, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a tough time. At the same time, though, Jim, the marriage bug had come back to bite me, and my wife informed me that she was going to file for a divorce. And so I stepped out of ministry, um, worked on it for a couple of years, and she finally did file, and, and we moved on. Had two kids, eight and nine, and I still remember the look on my daughter's face when we told her what was going to happen uh, to this day. So pain happens. No matter what you're trying to do, it still um, disrupts the lives of uh, many, many people, especially those closest to you. Spent the next 23 years in corporate America. Thought I'd be there three to five years. I was there 23 years. But I got to tell you, Jim, the marketplace ministry, touching people who will never go in the doors of a church, was absolutely phenomenal. I cannot tell you how blessed I was to be able to do that because those, those people that I'm working with, who I'm leading, who are on my team, who are on the team next to me, um, they'll never darken the doors of a church. And yet they need a testimony of grace and forgiveness and hope as they walk through the stuff they walk through. So ended that thing, uh, you know, several years ago and wasn't quite sure what I was going to do, Jim. Uh, it's like the question, what am I going to do when I grow up? And um, that's kind of where I was in the journey. A friend of mine introduced me to uh, Jim Grassi, who founded Men's Ministry Catalyst. I went there just to help him consult. I didn't go there to be on staff. But about three months in, my wife looks at what I was doing and she says, Wendell, that's your next opportunity. And I said, wow. Thank you for that. That was awesome. So uh, he and I began to talk. And uh, three years ago, I did come on staff with Men's Minister Catalyst. Our purpose and our primary mission is to really help local churches develop an engaging ministry to men because so few have them. And so few are really, really committed to building men. They create programs, you know, the Saturday morning breakfast, the handful of small groups, the weekend retreat or advance or some of those things. But th that's not ultimately potentially transformational. And that's what really we're all about. That's what you're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do. We're trying to help create an atmosphere, a relational atmosphere, 
where men are safe, where ultimately transformation can occur. So I've been doing that for three years. Uh, I, I love the opportunity, um, but uh, I just thank God that uh, he's a, a loving, healing, forgiving, grace-filled God. Mm. So when you say create an atmosphere where men are safe, how do you define that? How do you define safe? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, so unfortunately in the church, we do a lot of Bible bashing, meaning not bashing the Bible, but taking the Bible to bash those around us. We're not lining up with Scripture. Uh, and um, it, it's fair that we need to share what the Scripture tells us to be doing. Most people probably have a pretty good idea anyway, even if they haven't read the Bible. But it, it's only fair when we do what Jesus did. And Jesus, at the woman at the well, who was the most despised of all people, and she knew it, uh, they met, and what did he do? He offered forgiveness. He offered hope. And he shared, go and sin no more. He wasn't saying, you keep doing do it any way you want to. I'll forgive you. Heaven's your home. No worries. He was real clear on the outcome, but the process to get to that outcome was really, really critical for her. She wouldn't have made it any other way. So do you think that when it pertains, as it pertains to men, that we need to change our process in the church? Is that what you're saying? 100%. 100%. Walk me through that. Well, what, what does that look like? Well, a couple of things. One is uh, it always starts with the lead pastor. Yeah. The pastor sure. sets the tone of the culture. What he does, I'll just leave it at he for now. What he does is what the culture becomes. So if he is judgmental, if he is, uh, re, um, you know, hardcore, uh, you know, this, this, this from the pulpit, people coming are going to be more hardcore, this, 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 and less relational in approach, less grace-filled, less forgiving, not only of, of themselves, but of others who may have hurt them. That whole journey is absolutely critical. So it starts there. Then it goes into the leadership of the ministry to men. I call it ministry to men, not men's ministry. Men's ministry is a program. It is, it's, a, it's a box. It's a Saturday morning breakfast, a couple of small groups, a weekend retreat, it's whatever. That's the box. But is that a relational atmosphere where men are free to share the, the stuff? And I'll just say the crap of their life and allow somebody who's looking them in the eye, representing God, God with skin on, to say, you know what? That sounds like a tough place to be. I love you. I care about you. Can we walk through this together and try to make this a, a better spot for you and ultimately those around you? Because you have a huge influence as a man. Oh, that's really good, man. You uh, you said earlier on in the podcast, you said it a couple times, and I agree with you uh, on this as well, by the way. You talked about people never darkening the doors of a church. So why do you say that? When you're when you t- working with these people, why are you saying that they will probably never darken the doors of a church? Is there a wound there? Have they been bashed with the Bible? What what have you seen? with? Because most of these people that you worked with probably have some kind of church affiliation, understanding, background, what's going on there? What happened there? Well, it's a unique situation, Jim, for a couple of reasons. One is when you and I were growing up, and I'm a little older than you, but when you and I were growing up, most everybody went to church. Or if they, if the parents didn't go, they sent the kids with a neighbor, a friend, or something. So, so we grew up, most of our generation, even the generation below us, grew up with some kind of a spiritual or church background, Right. But today, with parents not going to church, not sending their kids, there's a whole generation of people who have no spiritual memories. They don't know the stories that you and I know, David and Goliath and Noah and the Ark, and the list goes on. They don't know those stories. They don't see God's grace and redemption through those stories. They don't have a clue. The only thing they know about God is what they see from those around them who claim to be Christian. And the the biggest barrier for people coming to church uh, as often the people in the church, if we're not careful. And so we have to recognize that our life, whether it's in my neighborhood, my wife and I walk every day. We, we walk 10,000 steps a day, by the way. So we're in our neighborhood a lot. We have a Great Dane. Everybody sees a Great Dane. And so they come out, they come say hi. She comes and says hi. And so we have an opportunity to build a relationship with people who who I know aren't going to church because of our conversation. And I know they may have pain in their life because of somebody from a church at one point in time, well, who and may if, have uh, hurt them. Well, the thing, Wendell, that's that's tragic to me, and this is one of the things that really gets my blood pumping, is that 
You look at cohabitation, it's the same in yep. inside the church and out the church. You look at divorce, yes. you divorce. look at all of these yep. numbers. I'm just wondering, you know, why would I burn an hour of my Sunday or two hours of my Sunday? Why would I do that? Because my life looks no different than your life. You know, I mean, and this right. is part of it, right? We need to change lives. And I think, I think, I think that people have been wounded or broken. I don't like the word wounded, but broken, battered, beat up. You know, you, you and, and, and you said that we li- we're in a generation now where these people aren't churched. Are you seeing? Are you saying that there's a movement away from the church, or has that movement already happened, or are we in the middle of it? We're in the middle of it, uh, or maybe ho- hopefully. <laughs> I'd like to be optimistic <laughs> and say the tail end of it. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know that. Yeah, but it clearly has started. You know, prior. If you look at all the all the statistics today that Barner or anybody else puts out, uh, clearly there's a movement away. Now here's the hope. The hope is the younger generation and below generation X does have some kind of of passion and desire to be connected to God. And they do have a relational dynamic. And so as a result of those two things, we're seeing that the very youngest young adults are making a move back when they get married. They're making a move back towards God. And hopefully that includes back towards the church, depending on the local church there that they happen to connect with or one or two. So uh, the answer is yes, the movement has occurred. It's still occurring. And yet I think there's hope uh, because we're moving back towards God, at least towards. The well, you know, I think that we're in the middle of a revival. It's going to be happening soon because I did, I we're agree. in this post post modern post post church culture yep, and yep, people yep. have uh, are can kind of do whatever they want. There's no expectation and their lives are emptier and their families are more broken and their and and their their relationships are more bankrupt than they've ever been. And I think people 100%. are saying there's got to be something going on here. I think these people are I'm being lied to. Uh there there's something going on here and I think we're going to see a real movement to G, towards Jesus and I think it's yep. going to end it's going to inflate the church uh with a whole yep. new generation of of yep. Jesus people, yep. right? So but here's here's what I want to get into cuz you talk about awesome. that one of your one of your gifted areas is that you're great at fixing and uh, repairing broken personal relationships. And so, uh, and that relationship can be with a, a church that hurt you. Yep. It can be yep. with a spouse uh, uh, yep. that divorced you or cheated on you. It could be on a, a child that disappointed you. It could be on a parent that, that uh, you know, left you hanging, that avoided, that, you know, that neglected you. So, so let's talk. Can we talk about this thing? Because this is a, our guys that are listening right now, they, I bet every guy listening has one relationship in his life that's strained right now. So what what are what what, what do you talk to us about relationships and help, uh, repairing them? So to to repair anything, it has to be in a, a stable, um, safe environment, right? If you're going to glue something back together, and no matter what you're repairing, it's got to be in a stable, safe environment, so it won't be disrupted in the repairing as it as it's moving through the journey. There has to be somebody who understands the journey in that process as well, a mentor. A, a pastor, a friend, a father, if you have a good relationship with your father, somebody that, that can come alongside and, and, and be a guide to work through that process. Because you, you've never been through it before. You've never got to the other side. You know you're hurt. You know you're hurt. You know you're a little ticked off. You know that you're angry about some things. You know you feel isolated because the pain isolates. Uh, any kind of pain isolates. Physical pain isolates. Mental pain, certainly emotional pain, isolates. And so you become more alone and and healing healing rarely comes in isolation healing almost always comes in a, a context of a safe loving relationship so be it that a small group of men who really have learned to share together about the stuff that they deal with the the pornography they're trying to overcome the the marriage battle the trying to be ethical at work when everybody around me is unethical all those things are part of opening up and sharing and that that atmosphere really creates an um an atmosphere where somebody who's just coming into that says you know what if if god can do that in their lives maybe just maybe he can do it in my life as well uh transformation never comes from an intellectual belief it never does transformation always comes from a relationship where we're joined a relationship with god a relationship with others that you're willing to walk with, 
a relationship that you're repairing with a father, uh, huge father wounds in our world today, with a father, with, uh, 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 you know, and you don't have to repair a relationship to be set free. You just have to know that forgiveness, me forgiving them, sets me free, even if it doesn't do a thing for them. Even if they never say, I'm sorry. Even if they never say, you were right, I was wrong. Even if they never say, I want to be in a relationship, will you forgive me? Uh, even if they never um, desire to do anything other than continue to be uh, cast aspersions on you. Reaching a point of forgiveness and trusting God for the justice, because that's what we want. We want justice. To trust God for the justice gives us the opportunity to find find uh, freedom in, in forgiveness. Well, I don't know if it was Corey Tinboom or somebody like that said, to forgive is to set a prisoner free only to realize that that prisoner was myself. You know, and that's I, right. and I, and I walked right. through a series, I walked through a real difficult season about a decade ago where I had to work through forgiveness and, and uh, bitterness and resentment. And uh, it took about I would say two years. If I'm honest, it took about two years. Yeah. And yep. Um, yep. and I realized at the end of the day, I was the one in bondage. Uh, right. And it hindered me. So let's talk So let's talk about this, whether I am, uh, I'm a person who's left the church because I'm, I'm ticked off at the pastor, uh, whether I've, uh, I've got a marriage that's really struggling because I've got a spouse that for whatever reason, you know, uh, does, is, I'm not connecting with or a child. So we're let's walk through a pro, so let's walk through a process. So I think I do agree. I think isolation is the kiss of death. So if I'm in the church, I should have some guys and people around right. me that are trusted mentors that can help me. You should. Uh, I find that most people are normal and they just need wisdom. They don't need to empty yep. their checkbook. Yep. Uh, but if they do want to do that, they can give info at meninthearena.org and hit us up and get, become yep. one of our financial yep. partners. <laughs> so so, <laughs> so I do agree 100% that they need to have somebody to, to kind of stand in the gap for them, right? So I'm a guy, I'm a bitter dude, uh, or I'm, I'm dealing with unforgiveness towards somebody I used to care about because... I, it, it, you're so right, man. It's not a cognitive thing. It's not intellectual. No, this is no. relational. This is a heart thing. It's an emotional thing. So, so talk to me. So the first step then is to find somebody I trust who can kind of guide me through it. Is that what you're saying? I would say the first step before that is to say, I want help. I want uh, help. Because if, if, yeah, I want help. Because if you're, if you're so angry that you don't let anybody in your life at all, uh, you you just continue through uh, anger and, and and unforgiveness to isolate yourself more. It doesn't matter who try to come tries to come in your life. You're gonna you're gonna keep pushing them away and pushing them away. Hopefully, there's a man somewhere in your life that that when you try to push, they just they just stay right there. They're a rock. They don't push away. They don't move away. Um, I just had lunch uh, a while back with a man. Who uh, who feels extremely isolated, struggling in his marriage, challenged with his kids, um, and and uh, going through a very very difficult time. And he said, "I just wanted somebody uh, to call me. I just wanted somebody that I reached out to to respond back and say, hey, uh, how can I help? Well, I, I love you. I care about you, but but nobody did." Uh, and, and I had no, no idea where he was in the journey. He hadn't reached out to me. And when he finally did, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I did reach back out because I care about this guy a lot. And I just assumed he was really busy because he kind of disappeared from life. And But it was important you find somebody that you can trust. Well, and that, I think uh, I, I that want, you will do that. I, I wonder, Wendell, because I've had those same situations and I, I, I've discovered that the people that are whining about people not reaching out to them are the people who personally and strategically isolated themselves. So right. I, I mean, 100%. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that this guy's friends were at fault here. I'm, I'm wondering if he's just because you said here, step one, I want to, I want help. So that's I help. and I wrote the word denial down. So yep. you need to overcome yep. denial yep. and actually reach out for help. And I wonder if this guy waited, right. expecting, and people aren't going to come. Unless you They're not tell gonna them, come, yeah. Unless unless you tell them, I I need something. I need yes. I need you. I I need to connect. Yeah, I mean, I, I need, if you change the dynamic, it, it absolutely most many people, not everybody, many people will respond appropriately. When yeah, you, when I think you share so. I think right people story. in the church. I think that I personally believe that the church offers the one thing besides Jesus and salvation. The church offers one thing that the world doesn't offer: in depth soul 
reaching relationships. And the church yep. does so good in crisis. I mean, we can say what we want about the church, but I'll tell you what, if I had if the if the bottom dropped out of my life, I would have a yep. hundred people rally around me and they would all have yep. one thing in common. Yep. They're, They're Christians who are, uh, yep, and they attend my church. Absolutely. Yep. And so yep. I have no yep. doubt in my mind. And so I think the church yep. does so good in crisis. Um, so so, so yeah. overcoming denial, saying, I want help. So a guy says, okay, I want help. And then there's the next step, finding that help. What's the next step for that guy? Well, hopefully, hopefully they have some kind of a relationship already. Yes. If they don't have a relationship with somebody that can be a guide and a mentor to help them through the process... Maybe they could ask a friend, hey, it looks like you went through some things similar to me. Uh, you had somebody that reached out to you. How would you make that happen? Are they available? I really don't have anybody I can think of right now, but I, I need somebody to help me. Go to a pastor. That's a risk because you don't know what they're going to do. You don't know how they're going to respond. I, I, I trust that they're going to respond appropriately. They can't walk you through it all but they can maybe connect you with somebody who can, if nothing else. Maybe they could be the connector. And maybe this is where, uh, 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 I think outside the church especially, maybe this is where a professional counselor comes in. You don't have any relationships yeah. to tap into. If you have nothing. So yeah. pay yeah. somebody who's paid to do it, and that's their job. So yeah. so yeah. then, so, yeah. then yeah. I, so I have this relationship with this person who's guiding me. What are they going to guide me to now? You know, we often forget, guys, that God has called us to steward the bodies he gave us so that we'll be ready, healthy, and spiritually dangerous to fight the good fight. That's why we're so excited to partner with Mountain Tough Fitness Lab. Join me on my journey by going to mountaintough.com and getting your free six-week trial when you type in the code ARENA30. You won't be disappointed. Stay dangerous. Well, so much of healing comes by expressing the hurt, sharing the hurt, and wanting to come to a point of being able to release the hurt. Um, you've got to be able to release it. If you're if you're just so angry that all you want is justice, 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 and justice to you means punishing the person that hurt you, you're not yet at a point where you can be healed. You're still at a point of, of I, I just, if I had a gun, you know, I'd end it. They'd be not me, them. So uh, it's 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 that kind of anger that refuses to allow you to move forward in your healing. Well, here's the here's the thing about so when you say justice, I am I am thinking the uh, opposing sides. You know, good guy, bad yep. guy. I'm yep. kind of thinking yep. ledger people, like you're balancing your checkbook. Sure. But sure. what I have found in my own personal life, whether it's somebody who's bitter towards me or I'm bitter towards somebody. Many, many times that person's not even around, doesn't know or doesn't care I'm bitter. So there's no and, and justice then, involved because right. that person has no idea. Right, right. And, and that's why no justice can ever be involved. We still want them to come and say, I'm sorry, or we, something. We still want that to occur for, for them to admit that something was wrong. But so many times we get, we get offended and hurt deeply and the other people either can't realize what they've done because of their own issues and many of them have significant issues themselves or they don't realize because it was kind of a passing thing never intended potentially as it came out but that's how you perceived it mm -hmm. and, and the relationship was over and you still carry it yeah for sure absolutely i mean yeah, i had yeah. i had a person for came to me and said they forgave me for something that i t emailed them in passing and and they they took what I said literally, and I even put a little smiley emoji kind of thing, like, yep, hey, yep, yep, hey, yep, I'm just yep. this is hey, you know, let me know when this happens, you know, uh, and and people just misconstrue things, you know, for them perception is reality. So so I need yep. to find. So are you saying then I need to be in a position? I need to be in a a, a place to to forgive. So I mean, I guess if I've got this person who's going to help guide me, but I'm not ready to actually go through the steps, uh, he can't guide me to anything. So it's, it's all about baby steps to start yeah, with. Yeah. It's about, it's about, you know, what would it look like for you to get to a point of being able to forgive? So have them try to imagine, have them try to create, what does it look like for me to actually get to that point to be able to forgive? What's the barrier between where I am today and where I could be tomorrow uh, and and what's going to take me to, to walk through that journey? So if I think about what it's going to take to get to forgive, it might be um, I just need to recognize that 
that person either doesn't know, doesn't care, or will never come back. So I have to release that so I can be set free. And and that's a hard thing to do. Um, I, I, I know a guy who struggled with his dad forever. And it actually never got any kind of reconciliation or freedom until his dad passed away. When his dad passed away, he was no longer able to hear from his dad, son, I love you. I'm sorry I hurt you. Never my intent. God created you special. Never could hear that. So when he realized he was never going to hear it because dad's dead, right? His dad is dead. Then he began to come to a place of, you know what? I need to figure out how to move on. And that had been a barrier in this man's life for 40 years. 40 years. But it took his dad passing away before he got to the point of, of being able to come, grapple with the fact that it's never going to happen. So if it's up to, if it's going to happen, I got to make it happen. This forgiveness has to be on me, well, and, not on him. And this forgiveness thing, I think we downplay it a little bit. Um, I know for me, I, ha- I ended up having a back surgery, and I'm I am convinced it was because of unforgiveness. Oh, I'm wow. convinced. And Jesus had some pretty strong things to say about forgiveness. Do you want to share any of that? Did. What, what, what did Jesus share, and why was Jesus so passionate about forgiveness? Well, first of all, he's the author of forgiveness. But his, his really one and only condition, after we become, it's after we become a Christian, that's the condition, is that if you don't forgive your brother who has offended you, then I, I can't forgive you. So it puts us in a quandary, right? Where John 3.16, everybody loves to quote that. God sent his only son, and, and whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be saved, right? That's the verse we love. But the other verses are, you know, once you're in the path, you've got to forgive those who hurt you to maintain and keep living in God's forgiveness. And it's not that he withdraws forgiveness from us. It's that we can't accept it and receive it anymore because we're in so much pain and anger and anguish that we can't receive that forgiveness. We're all bottled up within ourselves. And it and it prevents the forgiveness from flowing into our life. And being forgiven and know that you're really forgiven and have walked in that forgiveness because of the sin in your life, the commit that you had, the very fact that you realize I can never get to heaven unless Jesus forgives me. Those two or three things that my 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 own sin in front of my eyes. And listen, a, l- a lot of people are better without grace than I am with grace. So not everybody's in that that boat. I get it. But um, most people have enough stuff in their life, shame, whatever, that they've dealt with for a long time that that when God, they really understand God's forgiveness, then it's like, wait a minute, if God can forgive me of this, maybe I could learn how to forgive him of this. Well, and, and I've received it. Yeah. Now I can give it. Well, Jesus told a parable about a man who was forgiven this insane yeah. amount of money, and then he grabbed one of his servants and choked him out. And and yeah. Jesus, and the the in the in the parable it was God was the the figure basically said yep. hey buddy you're 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 gonna go out there and do some teeth gnashing because exactly. you're not willing and so I think the thing to re- realize here is my sin is so much greater and yes. so much weightier and cost yeah. the father so much more in his yeah. son Jesus so much more than anything I'm carrying towards another person that if I cannot forgive this little thing, and I know it yep. may be big to me, I know it may it's be big, big to me, but yep, in the context big. of eternally, eternity, it is tiny. Right. It is a tiny, right. tiny yeah. thing. So in the yeah. con- contextually, if we're unwilling to release uh, a person uh, through yep. forgiveness, then yep. then then we need to, we may not have received the forgiveness right. of Jesus. Or, or we right. don't understand it, right? We certainly don't understand it. We're not living in it. That is for sure. I mean, he also talked about, you know, the speck in your eye versus, or the log in your eye versus the speck in somebody else's eye. So our own issues always seem so much bigger, more important, weightier, uh, et cetera, than anything anybody else could do for us. It's, it starts with us, always, always. My, my marriage starts with me, right? My relationship with my kids start with me. It doesn't start with them. My relationship with a neighbor starts with me. My relationship in the workplace starts with me. All of those things start with us. Uh, and if we're willing to take the initiative to allow that forgiveness to flow through us and cleanse, cleanse us, 
then we we're positioning ourselves to be able to forgive others around. You know, it's funny when I was working through this over a decade ago, I had my accountability partner said to me, yeah. Hey bro, your bitterness is your problem. <laughs> your yeah. unforgiveness yeah, is fair. your problem. And he, fair. and I was like, what do you mean? He goes, well, what they did to you is what they did to you, but you being bitter and resentful is your problem. You know, right. it's kind of like right. angry. Oh, you've made me angry. Hold on a second. No, 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 my no, no, anger no. is my problem. You may have right. done things, but my anger, my choice to rage is my problem. So I think when it comes to this forgiveness thing, and this yep. is really serious, Wendell. I mean, I it cannot is. tell you how many Christian guys are really struggling with one person in their life to forgive them. They, yep. They're really yep. struggling to forgive somebody. And uh, and and they, they they and they you know they they oh I've forgiven them I've 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 forgiven them but then they see them in the grocery store and they dive into the fresh fresh the frozen they, they, food section to avoid that's them. Right. They go the so, other way. You know, yep. they can't look them in the yep. eye. So yeah. So yep. what? So what did Je- Jesus? I felt like give, gives us a recipe to forgive in Luke chapter six. What are some things that you like to speak into the lives of the people you're working with and helping them to restore, not restore, to to find healing to uh, find yeah. forgiveness, to repair these relationships. What are what are the things that you recommend or the steps that you recommend here? Well, I, I, we always go through what are the consequences of not forgiving? I mean, what, what are the consequences? I mean, if you don't forgive, what happens? What happens in your marriage? What happens with your kids? What happens in the workplace? Because sometimes, you know, that anger and bitterness is towards a, a previous boss, a co-worker, something. You're jealous of something. Right. And if you don't forgive, what happens? I lose my job. I lose my marriage. I lose my kids. Uh, the list goes on. I mean, the consequences can be devastating if we don't forgive. And so uh, making somebody or helping somebody come to a realization of this is where the road I'm headed. And if it continues to uh, get bigger and bigger, uh, it, it's a dead, uh, absolute dead end. So, again, you got to visualize what it would take to, to actually to forgive. But you also have to visualize what's going to happen if I don't forgive. What's the consequences of me not forgiving? And most rational people, no matter how angry they are, they understand at that point, it's like, you know what? I really have to come to a point of dealing with this at some level. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not a one and done, Jim. It's, it's a process. You know, I, may, I choose to forgive, but I have to walk in that forgiveness. And I know if I've forgiven, to go back to your story, of I see somebody in the grocery store, am I diving away? Or am I willing to walk by and say, hi, how you doing? Hope you have a good day. That's how I know whether I've really done it or not, right? And and here's, here's the other part of the story. One day you may be able to do that and say, hey, good to see you. I hope you're doing well. How's the family? Blah, blah, blah. The next time you see them, you may have to dive. You may feel like, I can't, I can't do that today. I'm just not there. So it's like two steps forward, one step back is what happens. Well, you you hit the nail on the head, man. It is a process. So when I hear somebody who I know is clearly walking in unforgiveness saying, well, I've forgiven them, I go, well, hold on a second. Yeah, Have you really forgiven them? Like I talked to a guy who is very angry at me personally because I have a relationship with another pastor, and this guy can't stand this guy. And as we're yeah. unfailing this, I, you know, one of the things shared was, well, I've forgiven him. And I go, well, bro, it doesn't sound like you've forgiven him because you're angry at me because I have a relationship with this guy. Yep. You know, yep. So forgiveness is more than words, and it is not yes. an event. It's never an event. No, no. It's never an no. event. It's always a process. No. And I, I liked what you said about two steps forward, one step back. So how do you – okay, so let's, 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 let's walk through this. So in my journey – and I'm I'm so glad I went through this journey, but it was a nightmare while I was going through it. Absolutely. I found I found Luke chapter six where Jesus said, "Pray for your enemies, pray yep. for those yep. who persecute you." And for me, yep. that unlocked a world of forgiveness to me. And the mm. the person who who um, who I was struggling with, I probably became yep. the man who prayed for this person more than anybody on the planet. I mean, That's I awesome. prayed for this guy. And it was a process. I prayed about this yep. guy, and yep. then I began praying against this guy, and then I began praying <laughs> for this guy, and I began praying uh, blessings. And I noticed that when my change, my prayer process changed from praying curses, you know, get him, God, sick him, to pl- praying blessings, I knew that blessings. I had crossed over. And, and what, well, here's the yep. funny part. I knew I crossed yep. over, and I was no longer dragging this person around on a chain behind yep. me. Uh, 
That's a great visual. And That's so, a great visual. I don't know, man. I, I just, I, I think, I'm, anyway, I'm speechless. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you can't, you can't pray blessings and su- sincerely mean it over somebody. When you're, you know, on the other hand, want to pray curses. So that's part of your process as well. If you will commit to pray, I love that. That's a great step. If you'll commit to pray for them, um, no matter how you pray, you know, like I loved your journey about for curses, blessings. I mean, that, that's that's probably <laughs> that's a good gamut of exactly what happens. But when you finally get to the point where you're really praying blessings blessings over them, you know your heart has been set free at that point. Well, and I'll be honest with you, Wendell, that. and I know this isn't going to sound like I'm a real good Christian guy, but early on in the process, I mean, there was some cussing. Uh, oh, sure. I, mean, there was, I was angry. saying Absolutely. stuff, because here's the deal, bro. Yep. God yep. already knows yep. the pollution in my heart. Amen. And if I'm bitter or right. unforgiveness towards the church, towards a church yep. leader, towards a spouse, towards an old friend, towards an employee, towards a boss, towards a child— God already knows every evil, vile, horrible thing in my heart. So yep. w- the first step for me that helped me was to just get it out and go, God, yep. here's what I, I feel agree. about this little MF yeah. type of thing. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah, I was exactly. kicked. So and so, you. Yep. And yep. so yep. you know, I mean, I was, you know, if I'm just telling you the journey, right? And man, yep. that was, no, uh, you know, that was, you know, and you talked about your first step. It, your first step is overcoming denial and saying yep. you need help. And I mean, I'll tell yep. you what, find your guide, but also you got the Holy Spirit living in you. You do. And so uh, he's do. also there to help. You do. So yeah, I don't you know. Do. I don't have a question around that. I just am going back and I'm revisiting my process. Do you find that people are resistant to praying for the people that have wounded them? Oh, 100%. 100%. They'll pray about them, but yeah. to pray for them, pray blessings on them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it's like walking up to their door and handing them a gift. And to think about that when you're really angry and bitter at somebody else, you want to walk up to their door, knock on their door, smile, genuinely care, and hand them a, this fabulous gift. That's just not in the cards at that point in time. Uh, but you can get to that point where you are then uh, set free. It doesn't matter what the response is. They may slam the door in your face. They may not answer the door. They, any number of things. You're still free. You're no longer looking for justice. You're looking for mercy. Because God has shown you mercy. You're trying to give them mercy in that journey as well. You, you've said this a couple of times, and I just want to restate it because I think it's so powerful. When you surrender justice, yep. and you're defining justice as it doesn't matter how that person who hurt me responds to me or whether they're even alive. Yep. No, it does not matter how they respond or react. I am not going to seek to uh, seek retribution. I am exactly. not going to live in this ledger or this expectation uh, or this or saying, hey, I forgave you. Now it's time for you to reciprocate. Yeah, exactly. 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 Because when you say that, you haven't really forgiven. I mean, yeah. So you, you, you've seen the, the picture of the of the ledger, right, where you've got the scales. And, and right now, because you're so angry, the scales are tipped and they look like they're in a better spot than you. And you're clear at the bottom and you're you're in a bad, bad spot. But what you're trying to do is reverse that where you are then set free. And it doesn't matter what the other side of the scale looks like. They could be up, down, middle, non-existent, doesn't matter. You're OK with wherever they are, recognizing that that God ultimately is the is the man of justice. And it will work out, and you don't need to worry about it. God's justice is not our justice. My justice is get them, sick them. Uh, His justice is I died for them just like I died for you, bucko. Um, And uh, I love them just like I love you. We have a better relationship right now than they do with me, but it doesn't matter. The, The love and the grace and the mercy is the same, whether you're in a relationship with God or whether you're not. It's identical. So I know that I've come full circle with forgiveness when I no longer seek justice and retribution. Right. I love what you said. You said grace and mercy. So I look at grace and mercy as as God's hand. On the soft side of God's hand, I have G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. And on the other hand, I have his mercy, which is the backhand of God. And I've got an acrostic for that I made up one time, but it's not good enough to repeat. So, But (laughs) it's the withholding. I love it. So let's come full circle with with this podcast. So, okay, we started with these guys that are disconnected from the church. They've been hurt by a youth pastor. They were bored to death by a priest. They were, yep. uh, they had yep. a senior pastor who had a moral failure and really damaged yep. the church. So these are yep. these are 35, 45-year-old men now 
who are like, yep. man, you know, Jim, I, I love Jesus, but you know what? The church, I don't really like the church too much. So let's help these guys right now. Let's talk to those guys. How do those guys walk through a process? And I can hear them right now. I can actually hear them right now saying to me, well, I've forgiven. I'm just not going back. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I would probably push on that and say, yeah. have you yeah. really forgiven uh, you know, the bride of Christ, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So right. what would you right. say to these guys right. that are not, not these post postmodern post culture guys that don't have any right. church background, but I'm talking about the guys that have a background yeah. and they've something happened and experienced. They're like, I'm out of here. So what, what would you well, say to those guys as we deal with this forgiveness? Is that a forgiveness issue or is that something else? Well, I think it's a cautionary. Um, it, it may be forgiveness. It absolutely may be forgiveness. It may not be. It may be a, a trust issue with with a, a pastor, uh, which may or may not have anything to do with forgiveness. Right? It may just be a, I don't. I'm just not sure. And so it takes time to walk through that. And again, not every church is going to be receiving of of uh, uh, you, and not every person, not every church culture fits you. So there there are a lot of churches around. So I you know, be particular. I'm okay with that. Find one that works for you. And uh, and make sure that you're connected in a way that that allows you to grow. Uh, we're called to assemble together. So what does that mean? I mean, there are house churches today. Maybe they want to be a pastor of a house church. I'm okay with that as well. There are house churches all over. I mean, there's a big house church movement. And if you're in a if you're in a communist country, house churches are all there is. By the way, there's no churches on the corner. That's your only option. So uh, maybe that's an option for you. I, I have some good friends that. Uh, worked for me at Promise Keepers who who have started house churches. And it's like, wow, that isn't really what I was thinking about, but why not? That's how the church started. Why wouldn't it work again? That's where revival is coming through. Uh, college campuses, house churches, uh, some larger churches where God is really doing some amazing things. But revival isn't about anything that happens in a local church. It's about what happens in my heart. I am revived. I am transformed. I am changed. I am on fire. My identity is in Christ. I'm willing to accept that. And as my identity is in Christ, I'm willing to share my faith. Here's what I was before Christ. Here's what happened, how I came to know Jesus. And here's what God has done in my life since. He's helped me with forgiveness. He's helped me with anger. He's restored a marriage. He's uh, re restored a moral failure. He's you know restored my business. I mean, the list goes on of all the things that, that God can do. And when men hear your testimony of what God has done in your life, they're drawn to that because they, they think to themselves, well, if God can do that for Jim, I bet he could do it for me as well. I'm willing to step in and try to take that journey and, and see where it goes. So I would just encourage you, man, try it again. Try it again and try church again. And if a church doesn't work, try another church. If another church doesn't work, try another church. Keep going until you find a, a fellowship that's either small or large, whichever you prefer, to wherever it fits in there to where you can come and, and truly worship God with a group of people who are are, are um, broken, hurt, trying to understand what God means in their own life, trying to live their life daily with their marriage and their kids and their workplace and their community, um, and just recognize we're all on the same journey together. Well, you said um, something a, a few minutes ago that I thought was really good. You said fellowship. And so yeah. maybe we don't call it church. Maybe we say you need to be in a community right. of believers that it, that you are fellowshipping with you're growing in the yep. word you're breaking yep. bread you're 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 drawing closer to Jesus you know you're you know what i mean you're sitting in, I, in the book I, of acts so. chapter 2 it said they listened to the apostles teaching well we can do that today it's called the bible right so it is. i think That's that right. i think that um i think for some the organizational church re works really really well we attend a church yep. Uh, we have yep, a church I home, and yep. uh, that works yep. for us. But yep. we also uh, are getting ready to launch our own home group because we want something yep. uh, deeper. We want to break bread. Yep. We want yep. something that we control yep. the structure. So I think there's, there's, there's. But the key here, you quoted uh, Hebrews ten, twenty four. Uh, let us consider how to spur one another on to love yep. and good deeds. Yep. But the next verse yep. says, "Let us not, let's not forsake gathering together as yes. some are in the habit." Habit of doing. of doing. And so we need to break the habit. We need yep. to maybe redefine church. Maybe we need to forgive yep. uh, a, a church or a church leader. Uh, but I think the bottom line is we need, and you go back to having a guide, you know, that, that church and those relationships provide those wonderful guides 
to help us on our journey. So I think that's yeah. uh, a powerful, powerful thing. And I, I just really would be overjoyed to see a movement, uh, at least in Men in the Arena podcast and our organization of men journeying back to the church. Yeah. You know what I mean? Amen. And Amen. that church, they can and, define and, that how they want. Absolutely. And every church, organized or not, uh, fellowship of believers, if it gets too large, it, it's not going to give you an opportunity to really share your life as as they did in the early house church days, where they shared bread together, they met each other's needs, all of that kind of stuff. If it's too large, that's all I got to happen. I go to a large church. That'll never happen in, inside the walls of the church. Yeah. But I'm also in a life group. We have you know, five couples that we, we meet a couple times a month. And that's where the fellowship really occurs. I have a men's group that I'm with as well, and the tremendous opportunity. And I'll use the word intimacy, which is probably a bad term to use with men, but it, it absolutely is because we've learned to share and care for each other. Mm -hmm. We pray for each other. We encourage one another. And the next time we meet, we ask about where they are in their journey. What's going on? How is, how is God helping you in that? What issues do we need to pray for you today about? It's not all you know, roses and, and uh, balloons, it's, it's where, where is life and what we're dealing with. You know, I'll tell you, yeah. Wendell, there's so, there's so much wealth in a man who has other bros who will call him into places he would normally never go and call yeah. him up I've, to a higher yeah. level. I mean, I feel like I'm so yeah. rich because yeah. I have guys like that. The wealth, forget too. the money, forget the stuff. But to have yep. that kind of wealth, hey man, yep. I'll tell you what, guys, if you're listening, you need to have men in your life yep. who will call you up in and out. You need men in your life I who will be it. guides when you're struggling and when you're in the dark places. And uh, we just need that. We just, and I, I don't, I mean, I don't ever use the word intimacy in my life, uh, right, right, not because right. it's not manly. I just, it's just too many syllables, but I mean, I like to lock <laughs> arms, you know, I like to, you know, ha you know, hang yep. out with my bros, you know, you know, that type of thing is important. And very important. So very important. So, got to have it. Oh, gotta man. It. I just. It, and you got to be vulnerable. I mean, you got to share the stuff. Otherwise, you, you know, again, it's back to if, if you are denying or not not admitting, which I think is the same thing as denying. If you're not sharing, you, you're not getting in the position where you can actually be healed. You can not in a position where you can actually move on, where you, you talked about the in, out, and up. I, you can't have those dynamics occurring. If you're if you're just a, a participant in the group and not an active um, person sharing, so it's you absolutely are, critical. You are absolutely but you gotta have, right. I mean, you, you got to have three to five guys. You can't do more than that. Three is probably the right number. Three or four, you can't have more than that where you share at that level. It just won't happen. You don't have enough time for one thing. But but it just it just won't happen. No, that's that's really yeah. good, man. Well, guys, listen, I want to give you a boots on the ground today because I think we covered a lot of stuff here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna do an experiment with you. And I'm gonna, and I want you to stay true to this. Don't lie to yourself, okay? I'm gonna ask you this question, and I want you to be honest with the answer. When you think of unforgiveness and somebody that you're pissed and bitter towards, what is the name that comes up right now? Mm. Okay, that's the person. It is. That it is, is your person. You need to work through it this is. process. Is there a church that has hurt you and caused you to go away from uh, a community? That is the church. So these, so now you already have your answer, guys. So now you can walk through this process. So Wendell, I, I know that you are uh, kind of an expert in this area. How do these guys uh, reach out to you and uh, Men's Ministry Catalyst uh, if they are interested in starting a men's community within their local church? Uh, the website is just mensministrycatalyst.org. Uh, there's a place where you can hit an email called contact at mensministrycatalyst.org. You can hit me at uh, Wendell at mensministrycatalyst.org. Any of those three will get to me. And uh, we are absolutely committed to trying to help you uh, build a fellowship, a community of, of men who become a, a, a movement of men who try to transform their world. Because that's what God has called us to. God is, I, I live here because God has called me to transform this community. I worked where I worked because he called me to transform that community. I now uh, work in, in, in a ministry again, thank God. I, I love the opportunity. But he's called me to help others transform their world as well. And it starts, by the way, men, with a marriage mm. and with children, if mm. you have children, if you're married. 
Uh, we've we've got to be God's man there first and foremost, and that is the hardest place to be at because well, you know, our wife, my wife, knows me better than anybody else. Oh, trust and me, she can call me out. She can call me out so easily. My wife calls me. <laughs> in. I don't like my it, but calls, I need it. She calls me in, out, and up more than anybody else, and that's you know that's what we do. We're we're uh, we are the oh, same person, it. right? So, and we didn't talk yeah. about this on this episode, but I do want to. I do want to draw attention to this. I think uh, when I asked you guys earlier to give me the first name that popped in your head, a lot of you are in marriages right now that are really, really struggling. And and I know there are some of you ladies listening right now because yep. you just want any yep. little help, anything, any little nugget to save your marriage. And so if you are a woman yep. listening today, yep. if you're a man listening, I'm telling you, work through this forgiveness. Accept, accept your spouse for who they are and work through this process. It is a game changer. Well, Wendell, thanks so much for coming on, man. I love your heart. It's always uh, you, it's great. I'm really excited that we got to meet each other a couple months ago in Detroit, and I look forward yep. to many, many uh, years to come, brother. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for, again for the opportunity. Again, I'm humbled. I'm thrilled. I love what you're doing. And, men, stay tuned in to what uh, Jim is doing on this podcast because uh, the nuggets are, are nuggets that can transform your life. Bless you all. Thanks Appreciate you, man. Time. Have a great day. Hey, guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you take the link, copy the link, send it off to one of your bros or more than one of your bros, and, uh, and that'll help them move along in their journey and becoming their best version. Until next time, feel the wet sand on the arena floor, hear the deafening roar of the crowd, taste the sweetness of victory, smell the stench of battle, get in the game, get dirty, grind it out, and be a man. <laughs>